there any way we can increase our chances for a long and healthy life? Dr. Joel Wallach explains why most chronic and degenerative diseases are preventable through proper nutrition. You'll learn why people in certain cultures throughout our world typically live well over 120 years with almost no incidence of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or other common illnesses that shorten human life. You'll also learn the vital role that minerals play in maintaining our health and why our modern diets are sorely lacking in these life-sustaining nutrients. Listen now to a live presentation by a man who is making a major impact in the field of alternative medicine, Dr. Joel Wallach. Well, I'm certainly glad you're here. How many of you grew up on a farm or still work a farm or have anything to do with livestock? Well, I'll tell you what, you're my kind of people because I grew up on a farm and West St. Louis County, and uh, we start out with beef calves, and uh, if, if you raise livestock, uh, the only way you can make money is if you raise a lot of your own feed, for those of you who don't have that experience. And so we raised our own corn, and we raised our own soybeans and our own hay, and we had a truck come out from the mill, and this truck would come out from the mill, and it would grind up the corn and the soybeans and the hay, and then we would add sacks of vitamins, minerals, trace minerals, and we'd make pellets out of it, and this is what we would feed the calves. And in six months' time, we'd ship them to market to be slaughtered, or we'd save back some of the best ones for ourselves. and we'd knock them in the head and eat them, put it bluntly. And um, it always fascinated me as a teenager that we did that for those calves, and in six months, ship them off to be slaughtered, or we'd eat them. And we wanted to live to be 100 years of age without any aches and pains, and guess what? We didn't take any vitamins or minerals. And that bothered me. So I asked my dad, I'd say, hey, Pops, how come you do that for those calves, you don't do that for us? And he'd give me this good old Missouri farm wisdom. He'd say things like, shut up, boy. You're getting this farm fresh food, and we hope you appreciate it. And of course, I was very quiet then, because I didn't want to miss out on any meals. Well, then when I went to school, I went to the University of Missouri School of Agriculture, and I got my degree in agriculture. I got my major in animal husbandry and nutrition. My minor was in field crops and soils, and then I got into veterinary school. As a freshman veterinary student, I learned the answer to my question. And the answer is this. We know how to prevent and cure diseases in animals with nutrition. And the reason why we do that is because we don't have major medical, we don't have hospitalization, Blue Cross Blue Shield, we don't have Medicare. If you're going to make money as a farmer, you better know how to do stuff yourself, and you better do it efficiently with feed and nutrition if you can. To make a long story short, after I got out of veterinary school, I went to Africa for two years and I was able to fulfill a boyhood dream. I was able to be a Frank Buck for two years and work with Marlon Perkins. Many of you will remember him from the Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom and he's a great gentleman. And after two years of working with elephants and rhino, people used to ask me, are, are you a small animal vet or a large animal vet? Well, I would tell them I'm an extra large animal vet because I worked with elephants and rhinos. Well, after two years, he sent me a telegram and said, would you come back to the St. Louis Zoo and work with us? Uh, we need a wildlife veterinarian at the zoo for a special project. We were given a $7.5 million grant from the National Institutes of Health, and what we need is a veterinarian who will do autopsies of animals that die of natural causes in the zoo. Well, I was just overjoyed to do that, and so I came back, and, and of course, I not only did autopsies for animals that died in the St. Louis Zoo, but the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, the Bronx Zoo in New York, the National Zoo, the L.A. Zoo, and so forth. And my job, again, was to do autopsies of animals that died of natural causes in the zoo and look for a species of animals that was ultra-sensitive to pollution. This is because during the early 60s, we had just learned about pollution and ecological problems and disasters, and uh, nobody quite knew what to do. And so I was supposed to find a species of animals that was extra sensitive and uh, use them much like we did the canaries in the mine. You know, the old Welsh coal miners used to put a canary in a little wicker cage and take it down in the mine. And if methane gas or carbon monoxide would leak into the mine, the canary would drop off the perch and die first. And the men knew to get out before the mine blew up or they suffocated. Again, to make a long story short, uh, over a period of some 12 years, I did 17,500 autopsies on over 454 species of animals and 3,000 human beings who lived in close proximity to zoos. And the thing that I found out was this. Every animal and human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency. 
And that fascinated me. It went back, took me back to those calves. I said, gee, that's fascinating. We could document this at autopsy, both chemically and biochemically and things that you saw with the eye at the autopsy table. Well, that fascinated me. And I wrote scientific articles. I wrote uh, eight multi-author textbooks and one textbook of my own. Cost 140 bucks for medical students. And I'm sure the only thing they do is use them for door stops. And I couldn't get anybody excited. I was on 2020. Uh, I was on 1,700 newspapers. I was in magazines. I was in every network TV that you can think of. And guess what? Couldn't get anybody excited back in the 60s about nutrition. So what I did was went back to school and became a physician to use everything I had learned in veterinary school about nutrition in my human patients. And to no surprise to me, it worked. I spent 12 years up in Portland, Oregon in general practice. And um, it was very fascinating. What I'm going to share with you tonight is what I learned over those 10, 12 years using nutrition with my human patients. And if you take home only 10%, it will save you an enormous amount of unnecessary misery. It will save you a gob of money. And those of you in Missouri know what that means. A gob means a lot. Okay, it'll add many healthful years to your life. Well, you can't do this. You can't get these healthful years. You can't have longevity. You can't live to your genetic potential just falling off a stump. Uh, you have to do some things. And the first thing I have to do is convince you that it is worth doing these things. Now, I'm going to start out by convincing you that the genetic potential for human beings is 120 years, our genetic potential for longevity. In May 11th, the oldest living American at this time and documented uh, through the Guinness World Book of Records was Margaret Skeet. She was from Radford, Virginia. She died at age 115 and she died of a nutritional deficiency. You can tell that from her, uh, her obituary. Uh, she died of the complications of a fall. What did she die from? Osteoporosis, very good. She died of a calcium deficiency. She had no heart disease, no cancer, no diabetes, no other infirmities, but she died three weeks after a fall because she didn't have enough calcium. Her daughter said that she had a craving for sweets until she died, and that's a, a disease called pica. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but usually when you have a craving for chocolate, if you're a chocoholic or a sugaraholic, uh, that means that you have a deficiency. Of then in a third world country in Niger, in Africa, a chief by the name of Bauer at age 126 was eulogized by one of his wives and she was bragging about him at his death at age 126. He was still in possession of all his own teeth. Okay, so you assume that other faculties are working too. Then, here's a gentleman uh, from Syria at age 133. He died in July of 1993. He fathered nine children after the age of 80. And uh, this meant if you add up nine months for each child and a year for breastfeeding for each one and a year between each one of the children, he was still fathering children after age of 100. So there's still hope for you fellas. <laughs> then those of you who like science, um, in November of 1993, those six biospherians uh, came out of that dome in Arizona. They were in there for two years, three couples, and they were supposed to eat the perfect food and recycle the atmosphere and grow their own food and whatnot and have no pollution in their water or air or food. And when they came out, they were examined by medical gerontologists from UCLA, University of California at Los Angeles. They put all this information, their physical and their blood work and so forth, into the medical computers at UCLA. And the medical computers projected that they could live to be 165 years old if they continued to do what they were doing. So all of that just says to you that there's a, there's a possibility you can live to be 120. And when I grew up on the farm, we could grow 200 uh, bushels of corn per acre. And with all the labor and all the fertilizer and everything else you did, you could make a profit if you grew 200 bushels per acre. But if you only got 100 bushels per acre and put out that same effort and the same fertilizer cost, you'd lose money. And so I want you to think about it. The average lifespan for an American today is 75.5. The average lifespan for an MD or a doctor is 58. If you want to gain 20 years statistically, just don't go to medical school. If you want to live to be 120, there's only two basic things. It's real simple, two things to remember. Number one, you have to avoid the pitfalls. You have to not step on the landmines, I call it. And those of you in the military, you know what that means. You do something stupid like step on one of those things, you kill yourself wastefully or unnecessarily. 
And of course, if you play Russian roulette or smoke excessively or drink excessively or wear a black sweatsuit and run down the middle of the highway at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to get struck by a car. Uh, all of those things are foolhardy, but it's amazing how many tens of thousands of people die in America from doing those stupid things every year. The last thing I will share with you on that subject of avoiding the landmines, I'd suggest very strongly to you that you avoid going to doctors. And I'm going to back up that statement, which is a pretty strong statement, from Ralph Nader's group in January of 1993, just about a year and a half ago, uh, January 13th. He put out a news release based on a three-year study on the causes of death in American hospitals. And it was a 1,500-page report, this three-year study. And I'm not going to waste your time or mine by going over the whole thing word for word. But the bottom line says a lot. Quote, 300,000 Americans are killed each year in hospitals alone as a result of medical negligence, unquote. I'm going to read that figure again because it's a huge figure. Quote, 300,000 Americans are killed each year in hospitals alone as a result of medical negligence, unquote. Now, he didn't say slipped away quietly out of neglect in a corner somewhere while they were waiting for an x-ray. He used the word killed. When you use the word killed, that means there was a procedure the doctor was doing went wrong somehow. That means that they gave them a wrong prescription, they put a decimal point in the wrong spot and gave them an incorrect uh, dosage. These people were killed, 300,000. To appreciate how big a figure that is, you have to compare that with our military losses in Vietnam over 10 years, where we lost 56,000 people over 10 years, or an average of only 5,600 a year, on a field of battle where people had guns and artillery and explosives trying to kill each other. And millions of people poured out into the streets and protested that war. We had political anarchy in the last three years of the war. Students took over universities and colleges with guns and explosives. National Guardsmen shot students at Kent State in Ohio. We chased a president out of the presidency for 5,600 military personnel a year. And here's one profession that takes your tax money in the form of Medicare and Medicaid and kills 300,000 of us a year, according to Ralph Nader, and I believe him, he has no ax to grind. And you can go out in the street any day of the week in any city, and there isn't even a crazy street preacher out there with a sign that says, protect us from doctors. I want you to think about that, folks. That's number one. You have to avoid stepping on the landmines. So there's a certain value in treating yourself when you can, or preventing disease so you don't have to get treated. Now, the second thing you have to do, number two, is you have to do the positive things. You have to do the positive things. And I'm going to start out here by just putting a figure up on the board. It's the number 90. And you need 90 nutrients in your diet every day. You need 60 minerals, you need 16 vitamins, you need 12 essential amino acids or protein building blocks, and you need three essential fatty acids. You need 90 nutrients in your daily diet. Otherwise, you're going to get a deficiency disease if you don't have them in complete numbers and optimal amounts. I can tell you that I was one of those nerds back when I was in college. I had a clipboard. We didn't have computers back then. So I had a clipboard, and I, I was one of those funny guys with glasses and would walk up and down in the student union there in Columbia and say, uh, do you take vitamins and minerals? I was still fascinated by that. And, and of course, people would kind of look at you crazy and say, well, yeah, I take vitamin E. And I'd wait for them to come up with the other 89, and they didn't. They just say, oh, I take vitamin E. Well, today, if you ask people, do you take food supplements? They say, oh, yeah, I take Tums because that's what, you know, they hear all the time. Well, again, you need 90 nutrients if you're going to make it, but the newspapers know and the magazines and TV and radio knows that we're interested in health and longevity and, and supplements. So they all talk to us, not because the medical profession has asked them to do that in their stead. The medical profession doesn't say, hey, we're so busy saving people with surgery and chemotherapy and radiation and pharmaceuticals, would you please educate the people on nutrition? They do it because it sells newspapers. Well, my favorite article of all time appeared in Time magazine, April 6th, 1992. And if you haven't read it, I'd urge you to get it out of a school library or public library and photocopy it. Stick one copy on the door in the bathroom and one on the refrigerator. It's a cover article, and it says, The Real Power of Vitamins. New research shows they may help fight cancer, heart disease, and the ravages of aging. Again, there's six positive pages in here. There's only one negative sentence. And it was issued by a medical doctor who was asked by the writer of the article, What do you think? What do you think about vitamins and minerals for people as food supplements? And here's what the doctor said, quote, Popping vitamins doesn't do you any good, sniffs Dr. Victor Herbert, a professor of medicine at New York City's Mount Sinai Medical School. We get all the vitamins we need in our diets, and taking supplements just gives you expensive urine, unquote. 
Well, to give you a Missouri translation of that, that means uh, you're just peeing away your dollars if you take vitamins and minerals. You might as well wad up your dollars and throw them in the toilet and flush them away because you're not getting any redeeming value from it. Those quacks are just taking your money for those vitamins and minerals. That's what he was trying to say. It got published. So it must be true, right? After having done those 17,500 autopsies and 454 species of animals from around the world and 3,000 humans, and liking to be healthy myself and having children and grandchildren and the not too distant future great-grandchildren, I'd rather pee out 50 cents or a dollar a day worth of excess vitamins and minerals. It's pretty cheap insurance. If you don't invest in yourself to the tune of a buck a day for vitamins and minerals, guess what? You're going to invest in the lifestyle of an MD somewhere. Because when you pay the medical doctor your fee for going to see him, not one penny of that goes to study how to diagnose or treat or prevent a catastrophic disease in a little child, like who was in here earlier, or how to prevent or diagnose or treat better breast cancer or prostate cancer in adults. Guess what that money goes for? It pays the doctor's mortgage, makes his Mercedes payment. It pays the tuition for his kids to go to medical school at Havid. You know where Havid is? Up in Baston. Pays the tuition for his kids to go to law school at Yale. Between 1776 and the Second World War, the U.S. government spent $80 million on health care and health care research and studies. Right now, we're at $1.2 trillion a year for health care. And it's free. We all know it's free, right? It's not free, but we're supposed to believe it's free, and everybody wants more of it and more free stuff. Well, I'll tell you what, if we used a human-type medical system for the agricultural industry and the livestock, your hamburger costs $275 a pound. On the other hand, if you use the agricultural health system that we use in animals for humans, your monthly insurance premiums for a family of five would be $10 a month. You take your choice. Well, I believe, since we've made them wealthy, through insurance programs and government subsidies. I believe they owe us something. I believe they owe us at least as much as the industries do, according to, for instance, recall notices. This was started, of course, I don't know, 25 years ago when Ralph Nader learned that the uh, Ford Motor Company had made a Pinto car with a rear end gas tank that would blow up when you got hit from behind at 20 miles an hour, fry everybody in the car. And when people complained to Ford Motor Company, they said, well, you're just dumb for getting in a car accident. We're not gonna pay you for that. Well, Ralph Nader says, no, it's a faulty design. So he went to a federal court and the judge agreed with him and through a court order forced Ford Motor Company to send everybody a uh, recall notice with a registered letter, bring that car in and they'll fix it for nothing. But they kill 300,000 a year and nobody protests as long as we get ours free. And that scares me, that attitude. At any rate, I've got a bunch of these recall notices you should have gotten over the last couple of years. We'll go through them quickly. Number one is ulcers. How many of you ever heard that ulcers is caused by stress? Okay, everybody's heard that. If you don't raise your hand, you got Alzheimer's or you're fibbing, right? <coughs> well, we knew 50 years ago in, in the uh, veterinary industry that ulcers, at least in pigs, was caused by a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. And, of course, we couldn't get one of these high-priced stomach surgeons from Mayo Clinic. In fact, we always used to yell, hold the Mayo, when they'd say stuff like that. Otherwise, your pork chops would be $275 a pound to pay for that kind of surgery. And we learned that with a trace mineral called bismuth and the tetracycline antibiotic that we could prevent and, and cure those stomach ulcers in pigs without surgery. And so that's what we did. cost five bucks to cure a pig of stomach ulcers with... Uh, Bismuth, the trace mineral, and tetracycline. Well, the National Institutes of Health now, not the National Enquirer, but the National Institutes of Health came out in February 1994 and said, ulcers are caused by a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori, not stress. And they can be cured. They actually use the cure word in this news release. Medical researchers never do that. They always say, it shows promising results or may be beneficial. They use the cure word, National Institutes of Health, and they say, can be cured with a combination of the trace mineral bismuth and tetracycline. Well, for those of you who don't know what bismuth comes in, you can get it from any grocery store or drug store. It's pink, about $2.95 for an eight ounce bottle, and it's called Pepto-Bismol. So a teaspoon a day full of Pepto-Bismol and some orimycin calfscour pellets, so you can take care of ulcers. Now you have your choice, whether you're going to treat your own for five bucks or go get whittled on. That's your choice. Then what's the number two cause of death in Americans? Terrible disease called cancer, right? Now when doctors get information on cancer, you'd think they'd photocopy that. And when they send you that bill, they should send you some photocopies of this stuff. 
Well, in September of 1993, the um, National Cancer Institute, not the National Enquirer, but the National Cancer Institute and the um, Harvard Medical School up in Boston did a study on cancer patients and they came out and they said an anti-cancer diet was found. Well, at any rate, they picked China to do this study because in one province, Henan province in China, they have the highest rate of cancer in the whole world. They took 29,000 people for five years in this study, and what they did was give them different vitamins and minerals at double the recommended daily allowance for Americans. Now, that's a trivial amount. For instance, they used vitamin C for one group, and of course the um, RDA, or recommended daily allowance for vitamin C, is 60 milligrams. Double that's going to be 120 milligrams. You can't go into a health food store and find a vitamin C tablet or capsule for less than 500 milligrams for an adult. And of course, Linus Pauling, the gentleman with two Nobel Prizes, says if you want to prevent and treat cancer with vitamin C, you've got to use 10,000 milligrams a day. Well, all the doctors who used to argue with him back 35 years ago were all dead. And today, Linus Pauling's still 94, and he works 14 hours a day, seven days a week on his ranch in the Big Sur in California and teaches at the University of California, San Francisco. So you have to make up your choice whether you're going to listen to the dead doctors or Linus Pauling. Your choice. Okay, vitamin C, double the RDA, nothing happened. Vitamin A, double the RDA, nothing happened. Zinc, riboflavin, the trace mineral molybdenum, niacin, nothing happened. In one group, they got a major benefit. In this group, they got three nutrients at one time. They got vitamin E, they got beta carotene, and the trace mineral selenium. They, those three were at uh, double the RDA. And if you get a half a percent benefit in any nutritional or pharmaceutical experiment, you've made a major improvement in humanity's life. And so these articles get published. So I want you to remember that statistic, a half a percent is major benefit. Well, in this group that received the vitamin E, beta carotene, and selenium for five years, deaths from all causes were reduced by 9%. Almost 10 out of every 100 or one out of every 10 who were gonna die in that five years from any cause survived. Then cancers, all cancers, 13% survived who would have died without those three nutrients. So 13 out of 100 lived who would have died. And then the type of cancer that was most prevalent in Henan province, stomach and esophageal cancer, 21% lived who would have died. 21 out of 100 lived. Now to me those are significant numbers and your physician for the number two cause of death in America should have sent every one of you a photocopy of that. At least giving you the information, even if he didn't want to give you the advice, give you the information, let you make up your own mind. Well, here's one I think is funny on one hand, and on the other side, it tells you the attitude of physicians. This has to do with arthritis. It was in September 24th, 1993 that it was released. Again, it was from the Havid Medical School and the Baston VA Hospital. How many of you in here have ever been to a VA hospital? Anybody in this room? Okay, good. Well, you know the people who've been to a VA hospital, you have two opportunities to give your life for your country. Once on the field of battle, and the others in the VA hospital, right? Well, at any rate, the title of the release was Chicken Protein Halts the Swelling and Pain of Arthritis in a Patient Trial. And what they did, they took people who failed to respond in any way to medical treatment for arthritis. These people got gold shots, mesotrexate, they got uh, aspirin, prednisone, cortisone, everything else you can think of, physical therapy. And the only thing left for them was joint replacement surgery. Okay, now before Harvard Medical School, the VA hospital was going to give it to them, they said, look, we're looking for some people who are willing to suffer for 90 more days, just three months, because we want to try something, a short-term experiment, and they got 29 volunteers. And what they did for those 29 volunteers who failed to respond in any way to medical treatment for arthritis was they gave them a heaping teaspoonful of ground-up dried chicken cartilage in their orange juice every morning. Just a heaping teaspoon of ground up chicken cartilage. And in 10 days, according to Harvard Medical School, all the pain and inflammation was gone. These are people who didn't respond in any way to medical treatment. In 30 days, they could open up a new pickle jar that had never been opened. And in 90 days, three months, they had maximum return of function. Here's the funny part. The funny part comes by a statement of the guy who was the director of that study from Harvard Medical School, and here's what he said, quote, listen to the words, are very important, quote, after three months it was clear that the drug was beneficial, unquote. Because it worked, chicken cartilage had become a drug. <laughs> you can see he's thinking about patent numbers and his eyes are rolling around with 300 bucks a capsule, 20 patients, and you can just see him calculating, right? That means if you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and you buy a bucket of chicken, throw away the skin and the meat and eat the ends off the bones, you're practicing medicine without a license. 
And if you go to a Kentucky Fried Chicken in the middle of the night, in the dark of the night, and you go to their dumpster and you root through there and you collect two five-gallon feed buckets full of chicken bones, and you take them home with a hammer and you pound off the ends of those bones and dry your own cartilage in the microwave, you know, you're manufacturing a pharmaceutical and the FDA is going to put you in jail. Next time I come by here in three months, you're going to run up on this stage and hug me and kiss me if you got arthritis. How many of you ever heard of Alzheimer's disease? Everybody's heard about it today. Fifty years ago, when I was a little kid, there was no such thing as Alzheimer's disease. It's a new disease, one of those things that just sort of happened. Now it's a major disease. One out of every two people who reach age 70 get Alzheimer's disease. It's pretty scary. We learned 50 years ago in the animal industry how to prevent and cure in the early stages Alzheimer's disease in livestock. Can you imagine how much a farmer would lose if the pigs were all laying there scratching their heads saying, why am I here? Where is the feed box? Because if they're not gaining a couple of pounds a day, you're losing money, right? So we learned in the agricultural industry how to prevent and in the early stages cure Alzheimer's disease. And we do it with high doses of vitamin E and low intakes of vegetable oil. And you say, Wallach, that's crazy. High doses of vitamin E. Well, you should have got a recall notice from your doctor in uh, July of 1992 because the University of California, I mean, we're talking about a sophisticated research medical school here. University of California, San Diego came out and said, vitamin E eases memory loss in Alzheimer's victims. Now, they're only 50 years behind on that from veterinary medicine, so they might be safer going to a veterinarian. Then how many of you in this room ever had a kidney stone? Anybody in here ever get that kidney stone? Okay, I see a few in here. What's the first thing a doctor told you to give up nutritionally when you got your kidney stone? Give up calcium. No dairy. No dairy. None of those vitamin mineral things with calcium in them because they have the stupid, naive, ignorant belief. That's pretty intense. They have the stupid, ignorant, naive belief that the calcium in your kidney stone comes from the calcium you eat. When in fact it comes from your own bones when you have a raging calcium deficiency, a raging osteoporosis, then you get kidney stones. We learned years ago in writing in the agricultural industry, if you wanted to prevent kidney stones in livestock, you better give them more calcium. You better give them more magnesium and more boron. Now the reason is, of course, bulls and rams, male cattle and sheep, have special anatomy. When they get a kidney stone, they die. They call it water belly. They die. When you and I get a kidney stone, we just wish we were dead. But no farmer is dumb enough to pay for the feed for an animal and have it die before you can either eat it or send it to market. So we learned how to prevent those things. Well, you should have got a recall notice from your doctor, especially you people who've had kidney stones. Your urologist should have sent a notice to you. This was uh, March of 1993. It says, uh, calcium limits kidney stone risk. And this is from the Havid Medical School up in Boston, by the way. In a study that turns conventional medical wisdom on its head, researchers have found that people whose diets are rich in calcium run a reduced risk of developing kidney stones. In a study of more than 45,000 people that, who were ranked into five categories, the group that had the most calcium had no kidney stones. Now, about five years ago, when I started out on this crusade and started lecturing to people all across America, and I'm in one time zone and the next and uh, all over, I knew I was going to get crazy out there uh, doing this. Last year I was on the road 300 days out of the year, 300 out of 365 days. And so I decided I needed to have a hobby that I could take with me. Every time I get a little wacko, I could go in my room and do this hobby and I'd be okay. You know, it'd be kind of like having a little piece of home with me wherever I went. And I wanted to have a hobby that would uh, uh, help other people. I didn't want to collect baseball cards because I like football. And I didn't want to do just crossword puzzles because good mental exercise, but wouldn't help anybody else. And um, I couldn't take my compost pile. I like to garden, and the hotels don't like that, you know. So I decided I was going to collect obituaries of doctors and lawyers. <laughs> now, as crazy as that sounds, remember I told you that doctors live to an average age of 58, and we live to 75.5. And here's a group of people, professionals, who pontificate to you and tell you, well, this is what you need to do. You need to give up salt and uh, no caffeine and you need to not eat butter and eat margarine and do all these crazy things. And they die at age 58 on the average. And anyway, I got a few of them here, some of my favorites. Uh, this is Dr. Stuart Cartwright, age 38. He dropped dead in his home. He was a family practitioner uh, of a ruptured aneurysm. That's a ballooning of an artery that's a weakened uh, artery because of the uh, fragmenting or the uh, brittle condition of the elastic fibers and arteries. Just like when you hit a chuck hole with your car tire and you break the cords in there and you get a balloon, he dropped dead like he was poleaxed, okay, right in his home from a ruptured aneurysm. Now we learned in 19, oh, I think it was uh, 57, 
aneurysms are caused by a copper deficiency. We had a pilot project, turkeys, and we made complete food pellets where you put all the 90 nutrients in there. And in the first 13 weeks, fully half of those turkeys died. Farmers were out there every morning picking them up by the bushel basket. They took them to the state diagnostic labs and they were autopsied and they found out that they all had died from a ruptured aortic aneurysm. So they doubled the amount of copper in there and the next year they didn't lose a single turkey from a ruptured aortic aneurysm. And they ran that experiment in mice and rats and rabbits and dogs and cats and uh, calves and sheep and pigs and whatnot and guess what? They found out that there's a whole series of diseases that are caused by a copper deficiency. Gray hair is the first sign. When you start getting gray hair, regardless of your age, you got a copper deficiency. You get skin wrinkles because the elastic fibers in your skin are going. Those little crow's feet around your eyes and facial and body skin wrinkles. You look like you're a little prune drying up. Okay. Then, of course, there's the um, varicose veins. That's caused by an elastic fiber breakdown. Then, of course, parts of your body begin to sag. Under your arms, your breasts, your bellies, your legs, all this stuff starts sagging. And you can go to a cosmetic surgeon or a plastic surgeon if you want, but it's a lot cheaper and a lot more effective and a lot safer if you just take some copper. Dr. Cartwright may have had a medical degree, but he didn't have expensive urine, so he died of something that even a turkey wouldn't die from. Then here's one. This fellow, he was a doctor's doctor, Dr. Martin Carter. He almost made it. He died at age 57. He got his medical degree from Havid Medical School and his PhD in medicine from Yale. He was autopsied by the best because he was a doctor's doctor. He said, uh, quote, the cause of death was a ruptured aortic aneurysm, said Dr. Jules Hirsch of the Rockefeller University Hospital, unquote. What did he die from? Copper deficiency. See, he didn't have expensive urine either. Then here's an attorney. She was so famous, she was from Detroit, age 44, Ellen Joyce Alter. Uh, she was in the New York Times obituary. She made the big time. And, uh, of course, she probably had steel buns because she belonged to one of those private health clubs. All these <laughs> gals want steel buns, you know, doing their little exercises. But she didn't have expensive urine <laughs> because she died of a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. When they don't do an autopsy, the symptoms could be called a stroke or uh, subdural hemorrhage, but very frequently they're caused by a ruptured aneurysm, which is a copper deficiency. She didn't have expensive urine. How many of you here have ever heard of a guy by the name of Stuart Berger? Stuart Berger, he, he wrote five best-selling books on health and diets and nutrition. He got his medical degree from Tufts Medical School, which is a very fine medical school in Boston, not too far away from uh, Harvard Medical School. And the books he wrote included The Southampton Diet for Weight Loss. He wrote Forever Young, 20 Years Younger in 20 Weeks, and How to Be Your Own Nutritionist. And he died at age 40. How'd you like to follow his dietary practices? He died at age 40 of cardiomyopathy, which is a selenium deficiency. The same cause as white muscle disease or, or uh, stiff lamb disease. And any farmer can go to a feed store and get selenium pellets or selenium injections, uh, things like Selatoc and Bose and so forth. And Dr. Stuart Berger, a guy who wrote five best-selling books on nutrition, died of a nutritional deficiency. He didn't have expensive urine. You can prevent, totally prevent, cardiomyopathy for 10 cents a day. And if we don't do it, we're malignant dumb, I like to call it. You're malignant dumb if you don't take in 10 cents a day worth of selenium. It's a waste of your life. That's one of those landmines you can avoid. The medical treatment of choice for cardiomyopathy is a heart transplant cost seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I want you to think about that. They get the heart free from a donor. They get the blood free for the surgery from the relatives. They use two dollars and fifty cents worth of suture material and they charge you seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for that procedure. Now six months ago in LA when they had the earthquake they were putting people in jail for sixty and ninety days for price gouging for selling these terrified people a gallon of water for four dollars. They put them in jail for price gouging for selling them a gallon of water for four bucks. Now, to me, that's entrepreneurialism. You know, that's being in business for yourself. If you had a, a way to distill water and make water and you had a car and you could get in there and sell those people a gallon of water for four bucks, hey, more power to you. Because if you go to a 7-Eleven and buy a quart of Evian water, it's $1.29. So four of those quarts is five bucks. Kind of interesting, isn't it? They said it was price gouging because those people were terrified. Well, talk about a person who needs a new heart. They're terrified. $750,000, we should put those doctors in jail. But we bow to them because, oh, that's high-tech medicine. Out of 270 million people in America, you save about 50 a year. Is that cost-effective? I don't think so. 
Dr. Stuart Berger didn't have expensive urine. Now here's the last one, and many of you may know this woman. Uh, her name was Dr. Gail Clark. She was age 47. She was the chief cardiologist of the West St. Louis County Group of Hospitals. Uh, she was the chief cardiologist for the um, St. Mary's Health Center in Richmond Heights in St. Louis County. She was age 47. Guess what she died from? Heart attack, a cardiomyopathy heart attack. You can just see her walking down the hall. She's got the stethoscope around her neck. You know, this is their little status symbol. Got my stethoscope around my neck. Back when I was in school, they folded it up very bravely and put it in their pocket. Boom! She falls down. She has a heart attack right in the hall. And, of course, the nurses scoop her up and put her on a gurney, and they call the technicians and another doctor, code three, code three, code blue, whatever it is, and they whip her into the room. And uh, you can hear them, let's say you're a cardiac patient, you're laying there, you're all hooked up to the monitors and the IVs, and, and you hear them say, okay, tear close off. Okay, stand back. Didn't work, turn it up, stand back. And then you hear that terrible sound when you know that the treatment didn't work. The flat line when you know the heart is gone. And everybody walks out of the room dejected, and you say, nurse, nurse, uh, what happened next door? And she says, well, you're a cardiologist. You know, the chief cardiologist of this hospital, age 47, Dr. Gail Clark, just died of a cardiomyopathy heart attack. We can see all the patients, they're holding their gowns. <laughs> and they're running out of that hospital, leaving their watches and their shoes and their checkbooks and everything and their plastic credit cards because they don't want to get what Dr. Gail Clark got. To me, the Reader's Digest is a magazine that never says anything negative or bad about anybody or any group. It's the sweetest little magazine that ever was. The September 1993 issue features an article that says, Can you trust your doctor? It lists 12 ways that doctors scam your money. And I'll let you read 11 of them yourself. I'll give you the worst one. In addition to their income from office fees and surgical fees and lab fees and hospitalization, doctors get a kickback from the labs and the, the x-ray labs and clinics and hospitals they get a kickback of $421 every time they send you in for a CAT scan or an MRI. And doctors tell you, oh, we do that because we're practicing defensive medicine, because if I miss something, uh, you know, one in 10 billion, you're going to sue me. So I do this just to protect myself. Well, if it was just to protect themselves and you knew them and they knew you, 90% of the people say, oh, just skip it, doc. If you don't really think it's necessary, let's save the money. But they got something more than defensive medicine to worry about. They get 421 bucks in a kickback for every time they send you in for an MRI or a CAT scan. Well, when I practiced for 12 years up in Portland, somebody come to me with a terrible headache, never had one, I'd just walk up to them and tap them on the sinuses. And if they'd collapse to their knees, I know they had a sinus headache. Oh, doc, why'd you do that? Well, I just wondered, that's a cheap lab test, you know. <laughs> then if they had, thank you. If they had blood dripping out of their nose, they'd take a $35 x-ray to see if they had a cancer in there. 35 bucks and a free lab test, as opposed to 421 bucks. If I wanted to make that 421 bucks, I'd have been a good thief. What I'd have done, I'd have built a chute right into that CAT scan machine, because I knew how to build chutes living on a farm. And I'd have gone out in the street, and I'd have got every homeless person, I'd line them up in them chutes, and I'd put soup and a Big Mac at the end of that tube, you know. And I'd say, I'm going to buy you $1.50 dinner, I'm a good guy, I'm going to buy you a $1.50 dinner, you just got to go through this chute, go through that tube, and you get your sandwich and your soup. Man, they'd be flowing through there, maybe 100 a day. And I could start adding some things up, it'd be a lot of fun. At any rate, the average doctor gets $228,660 a year in CAT scan kickbacks. A quarter of a million dollars a year. In any other industry, if you do that, politicians, lawyers, businessmen, stockbrokers, they get put in jail. But doctors, it's okay, because insurance pays for it. We don't mind if they steal, it's blind, it's free. Remember I told you I was gonna tell you about pica. Pica is a funny disease, P-I-C-A, I'm not talking about the type style that you see in typewriters and computers, but pica is a disease that farmers know about. Uh, in horses, it's called cribbing, when they chew on the feed bunk, the wooden feed bunk. You know you better give them some minerals, otherwise they're gonna eat that feed bunk. And cattle, dairy cattle especially, where they're losing lots of minerals through their milk all the time, intensive milking, uh, you'll see them picking up big rocks in the creek and chewing on them, or they'll chew on barbed wire, or maybe you'll see them walking down through a path with a deer bone in their mouth or something, or a shingle. That's called pica. And a good farmer or husbandryman knows you better give them some minerals, otherwise they're going to eat the barn or something. In human beings, we see this at funny times. Pregnant women are notorious for pica. Uh, in the middle of the night, they'll elbow their husband and say, hey, you better get up, I want some uh, pickles and ice cream. 
They're craving minerals because that fetus is pulling minerals out of their body. And they need some more minerals. And so it's, it's recognized as a craving for things like sweets and salt. We see this in pregnant women. I used to have people come to my practice and they say, Doc, do I need to go see a shrink? I said, why is that? Well, I wake up in the middle of the night and I, I go outside with a spoon and I eat dirt. And no, that's okay. Just make sure it's clean dirt. <laughs> then they say, my, my kid sits there with a kitty litter box between his legs and he has a spoon and he's eating that stuff out of the kitty litter box. And then in housing projects, little kids will eat lead paint off the walls and they get lead poisoning, get learning disabilities and bone problems and anemia. And we're good, so we spend $5 million to scrape the lead paint off of there and repaint it with latex paint. And all we have to do is give those kids 10 cents a day worth of minerals, be better for them and save us $5 million bucks. It's your tax money, and if we allow them to throw them away, those dollars, it's kind of interesting. If you have a selenium deficiency, and you don't want to wait until you get to cardiomyopathy and drop dead from a heart attack to recognize it, if you look on your hands and look in the mirror in your face, if you have liver spots or age spots, and I see quite a few from here, you have an early selenium deficiency that's called free radical damage. And fortunately for you, if you recognize that, and you start taking in some selenium in four to six months, those will go away. You'll reverse that in four to six months. And when they go away on the outside, they're going away on the inside, in your brain, in your heart, in your liver, in your kidneys. And if you have low blood sugar, how many in this room have low blood sugar? Anybody in here have low blood sugar? Okay, about 10%. How many of you have ever seen a hyperactive kid who gets on sugar? Okay, about everybody in the room. People who have sugar problems are like alcoholics. There's good ones and bad ones. You know, the good alcoholics are one when they get two drinks, they just go off in a corner and go to sleep, right? Same way with somebody with low blood sugar. They eat a big meal or they eat a piece of pie, three hours later, they clunk out and go to sleep. Then there's bad alcoholics. They're the one that gets two drinks in them and they get violent and raged and they want to fight everybody. Punch holes in the wall, and, you know, big brave fellows, and they kick their wife and kick the dog and take the chainsaw and cut their neighbor's tree down and all these wild things and drive reckless down the roads and kill people. Those are the bad drunks. Well, people who have blood sugar problems, there's bad blood sugar people too. They get a little crazy. Okay, I don't know how many of you remember the Twinkie defense, right? Remember if somebody murdered two people and he claimed he ate a Twinkie three hours before he murdered him, so they let him off because he got temporarily insane every time he ate sugar. Now, don't any of you try that. Well, chromium and vanadium deficiency will result in these sugar problems, low blood sugar, and if you let it go on for any length of time, you develop diabetes chromium and vanadium. Then a tin deficiency, the early symptoms of a tin deficiency are male pattern baldness. I see a lot of tin deficiency in this room. Yes. And if you let it go on for any length of time, you get deafness. Then there's a boron deficiency, and you gals should know about boron because it helps you keep the calcium you take in in your bones so you don't get osteoporosis. Boron. Also, it helps you make estrogen. It helps you fellas make testosterone. If you don't take in enough boron, you ladies are going to suffer miserably going through menopause. Okay, you're going to have all those terrible symptoms. You fellas don't get enough boron, can't make testosterone, you won't know whether to lead or follow on the dance floor. <laughs> you're going to be confused. She's saying he's got a boron deficiency. The first symptoms of a zinc deficiency is you lose your sense of smell and your taste. You say, oh, you know, food just doesn't taste good anymore and you don't have a cold or anything like that. And you say, your wife says, well, aren't you excited about dinner? I spent the whole day in the kitchen cooking dinner. He says, well, I didn't smell anything when I walked in. You know, he's got a zinc deficiency. Well, in laboratory animals, there's some seven rare earths. These rare earths are trace minerals you need in lesser amounts than you need trace minerals and they actually double the lifespan of laboratory animals. They've not been proven in humans yet, but I'm not going to wait 500 years for doctors to approve it. They're still arguing over vitamin C and calcium, right? So I'm just going to do it. Didn't kill any laboratory animals, it just doubles their life and it's not a drug. These rare earths are called lanthanum, praseodymium, neodymium, samarium, europium, ytterbium, and thulium. There must be a reason why they're named after Old Testament cities. Well, remember I told you we needed 90 nutrients we need 60 minerals, we need 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and 3 essential fatty acids. And of course, we're lucky 
in that plants as a group can make most vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. Plants can do that because they just take carbon out of the air and make carbon chains to make vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. But you have to eat 15 to 25 different plants a day in the right combinations to make this happen. Theoretically, it's possible, but most Americans don't do it. The average American thinks if they eat some potato buds out of a Betty Crocker box, they're eating a vegetable. Okay, so you've got to be careful what you're considering a vegetable. Then, of course, uh, people want to do right by their doctor and they eat low-fat turkey breasts and they put a half a jar of mayonnaise on there and they put it between two slices of Wonder Styrofoam bread. Remember that stuff you can insulate your house with and put in your shoes when you get a hole in the shoe? I remember when I was a kid, it was a lot of fun because we have Wonder Bread. We didn't have TVs back then on the farm. We didn't even have dryers that went round and round. So the only thing you could do in the wintertime was sit in the kitchen and wonder at a loaf of Wonder Bread and it had the blue and red and green and yellow balloons on there. And if you read the label as many times as I do, you know it said things like, helps build bodies at 12 ways. And about 15 years later, the FDA made them change it to help build your body eight ways. Now if you go to the store and look at Wonder Bread wrappers, it just says Wonder Bread. So it kind of gives you a clue. So even though this is theoretically possible, it's not likely to happen that you're going to get your vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids in proper proportions from your diet. And so if your life is as valuable to you as mine is to me and my children's and my grandchildren's is to me, I would make sure that I take in all my vitamins and amino acids and fatty acids because I guarantee you won't make it to 120 if you don't. You're just not going to do it. Now, minerals are another story. We have a tragic story when it comes to minerals because Plants cannot make minerals in any way, shape, or form, and if they're not in the soil anymore, they're not in our plants. Our farm soils and our rain soils are depleted of minerals, and the crops, the grains, the fruits, and the vegetables, and the nuts that are grown on these depleted farm and rain soils are minerally deficient, and the people who eat them get mineral deficiency diseases, and the only way to prevent and cure them is with mineral supplements. Do you think it's gotten any better? No. It has not gotten any better, it's only gotten worse. And the reason is, if you guys do what we did, and, and people continue to do, is we put NPK on our land, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and you see it as these three numbers in many combinations of ratios. And these represent percentages of these three nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And those of you who don't have any experience on farms, the reason why we do this is farmers get paid for tons and bushels. There's no subsidy that encourages people to put 60 minerals back in the soil. You get paid for tons and bushels and for 40 bucks an acre you can get the maximum yield in tons and bushels. It only takes five to ten years to deplete the land of minerals because every time you harvest a crop those plants pull minerals out of the soil. Many pounds per acre every time you haul a crop out. So soon those minerals are gone. And if you only put back in three and you take out 60, it's like a checking account. If you only put three bucks in your checking account every month and write checks for 60, what's going to happen to your checks? Boing, boing, boing. They bounce. Exactly. Well, I can tell you that our health is bouncing right now to the tune of $1.2 trillion a year. It's our responsibility, each and every one of us, to be responsible for our health and consciously take in these minerals. Well, I have a lot of people ask me, well, what did these people do thousands of years ago? They didn't even have commercial fertilizers. What did they do, these societies that had long-lived people and whatnot? Well, I want you to think about the Egyptians, the Chinese, people from India that lived around these great rivers, the Nile River, the Ganges River, the uh, Yalu River in China. And what used to happen was every year or so it would flood, just like it did here in northern Missouri last year. And every time it flooded, guess what would happen? It would bring silt or rock dust from mountains from 500 or 1,000 miles away. And those people would pray to every god they had, the water god, the sky god, the wind god, the rock god, to flood. We pray, don't flood. They used to pray to flood because they had their floods during the winter time and it would put silt and minerals back in the soil and their grain was very valuable. King Philip, who is the father of uh, Alexander the Great, married the 12-year-old child queen of Egypt, Cleopatra. She didn't look like Elizabeth Taylor all made up in beautiful costumes. She was a little flat-chested teeny bopper, not very sexy. But Philip married her because she controlled the best wheat in the world. And if he wanted his Macedonian army to conquer the world, through his son Alexander the Great. He needed the best wheat in the world so you could march 20 hours a day, fight for six hours and win. If they used the wheat from the depleted soils in Greece, they couldn't go 20 minutes without saying, Mommy, pick me up. Can you imagine these big Greek soldiers? Oh, my legs hurt, pick me up. And so they knew the best place to get wheat was from Egypt. 
It was those floods that gave them those minerals. And all those cultures that came up with all the great art and all the great technology came from those places because they had more intelligence, because they had more nutrition, more minerals, I heard somebody say. Very good. Well, you're getting the picture. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to pick out a couple of minerals, just a couple of them, so you get the idea. It applies to all of them. Let's just pick out a common one like calcium. Everybody knows about calcium. Calcium deficiency will result in something like 147 different diseases. They're just different names. They're named after people like Bell's palsy. You know, everybody knows about that. One side of your face sags. It's not a true stroke. It just affects your facial muscles. It's caused by calcium deficiency. We'll talk about it in a little bit. But everybody knows about this one, osteoporosis. It's the number 10 killer of adults in the United States. It's very expensive. It costs you $35,000 each for each hip to replace. It's okay. It's free. Insurance will pay for it. It costs you $70,000 for both hips. As expensive as it is, and the number 10 killer, remember? Mrs. Skeets from Radford, Virginia, aged 115 years of age. She died of complications of a fall. We don't have osteoporosis in animals, and it's because of farmers we don't have osteoporosis in animals. It goes like this. You have a, a pasture with 100 cows in it, and this year you didn't have any calves, you can't repay your operating loan, you're in trouble, right? Because you paid for the feed and the vet bill and mowed the pasture and fertilized and maintained the fence and fed the cows and all this, that, and the other. You don't have any calves, you can't pay back the operating loan and make any money. So you call the vet out and you say, do I get rid of these cows? What happened here? And he examines the cows, he says, nothing wrong with them. He says, let me look at the bull. And he says, aha, here's your problem. That bull has osteoporosis of both hips, can't breed the cows, didn't have any calves. He says, I'll tell you what though, he says, you give me $70,000, he says, I'll put two new hips in that bull, next year you'll have some calves. Well, the first thing that farmer says is, stand back, Doc. Boom! He blows that bull away with a deer rifle, and while the kids are grinding the bull up with a grinder and cutting roast and steaks off that bull, the farmer's chewing on a straw and saying, now, Doc, pushes Stetson up a little bit, and he says, you know I wasn't going to pay you $70,000 for that old bull. He says, I can get a new bull every year for 70 years for that. He says, but every once in a while I get a bull that throws good calves, I'd like to keep them. Is there any way I can prevent that osteoporosis thing from happening to a good bull? He says, well, yeah. He says, if you'll give a bull calf 10 cents worth of calcium every day after he's weaned, he'll never get osteoporosis. The farmer says, no, wait a minute, doc. You mean if I give that bull 10 cents a day worth of calcium from the time he's weaned, I can prevent a $70,000 disaster? He says, oh, yeah, it's that simple. He says, you mean all I have to do is give up a half a cup of coffee a day to do that? He says, yeah, that's it. He says, I choose that one. He says, I'll give up the half a cup of coffee. And that's what we have to think like. Then there's receding gums. Dentists and periodontists will tell you that if you want to prevent and cure receding gums, you better floss and brush after every meal. If you believe that works, I have some oceanfront property in Montana to sell you. <laughs> if you all know your geography, you know that doesn't work. Now, as a veterinarian, I've seen hundreds of thousands of animals of all kinds, mice, rats, rabbits, dogs, cats, sheep, pigs, horses, lions, and tigers, and bears, and they don't get receding gums. And they don't floss. Now, they do get funky breath, but they don't get receding gums. Well, if you want to smell something, you just let a camel breathe on you, boy. Well, the reason we don't have receding gums in livestock is because we've dealt with the osteoporosis problem. Receding gums is not a deficiency of flossing, it's in fact osteoporosis of the jaw bones and of the facial bones. So if you have gingivitis or receding gums, you have advanced osteoporosis. Those bones around your teeth are melting away little bit by little bit every day. And if you take your teeth out at night and put them in a glass next to your bed and that fizzy stuff, you have major advanced osteoporosis because all your bone has melted away. Then there's arthritis. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Remember the chicken cartilage? 85% of all arthritis is caused by osteoporosis of the joint ends of the bones. You're talking about degenerative arthritis, osteoarthritis, sciatica, lumbago, rheumatism, all those sorts of things. Um, they're caused by osteoporosis of the joint ends of the bones. I want you to think about something for a minute. If you don't take a pain reliever or, or an anti-inflammatory for that arthritis, let's say you get arthritis of the hips, you're going to kind of favor that a little bit, aren't you? You're going to get a cane or a walker or crutches. You're going to favorite and so you don't put any weight on it. I want you to think about that for just a second because then I want you to think about driving your tractor in a field or you're driving a Mercedes down the highway, either one, doesn't matter, whichever you love more. Let's say you didn't put the nut on that oil pan real tight and all the oil drained out and that light on the dashboard comes on and says, I'm getting hot, you better give me some oil and that light irritates you. 
So you stop, you open up the hood, you get your clippers out, you know, your fence clippers, and you clip the wire to that light, and you close the hood, and you just keep driving. Would you do that to your tractor or your Mercedes? No, you wouldn't. But we take those pain relievers for arthritis, and we go out there and square dance, and do the Texas two-step, and do our five-mile walks and our aerobics. That pill works real good, Doc, because it killed my pain. And you're just wearing that thing off faster and faster. Then your doctor's really going to get rich because you need joint replacement surgery. Then there's hypertension. This is one of my favorites, so I'll put a star over here. Hypertension is high blood pressure. What's the first nutritional thing that a doctor will tell you to give up nutritionally when you get high blood pressure? Give up salt. Everybody knows that one. That's been ingrained in our head. Well, they must think we're dumber than cows because what's the first thing you put out for your livestock and it's about that big? A salt block. No farmer is going to be economically viable if you don't put a salt block out for your livestock. They're going to die. Your veterinary bills are going to go crazy. But we're supposed to believe that we don't need salt. You can get everything you need out of your lettuce and your whole wheat bread and stuff like that. Well, don't believe that one either. If you believe that, I got some more oceanfront property in Montana for you. They took $30 million of your tax money, and two years ago, after a 20-year study, they came out and said that they took 5,000 people with high blood pressure, they took them off their medication, and put them on a reduced salt diet, a restricted salt diet, and they all died. No big surprise, but somebody got a PhD degree and everybody was happy, right? But when they looked at this results, they said that, oh, only 99.7% of the people didn't get any results from that before they died. 0.3% did get some result, dropped their blood pressure one point before they died by restricting their salt. So the referees who judged that article said, oh, doesn't matter, you might as well let high blood pressure patients eat salted peanuts and dill pickles and salt their food to taste because it doesn't matter. In fact, worrying about the salt is more stress than taking the salt. Then they had a control group with 5,000 people with high blood pressure and they doubled their RDA of calcium and they stopped the experiment in six weeks because 85% of them were cured of their high blood pressure just by doubling their calcium intake. Now they didn't cold turkey stop their high blood pressure medication, but what they did was they went to the doctor and he says, you don't need this medication anymore. What are you doing? He said, well, I'm on this experiment where I double my calcium intake. Anybody get a recall notice from your doctor saying it's okay to salt your food to taste and please do double your calcium intake? Anybody get that? Not a single one, that's very interesting. Then of course, there's uh, insomnia, that's where you roll around all night. You wake up in the morning, you're more tired when you went to bed, and that's insomnia. Of course, doctors have two treatments for that. They have Halcyon, which is a sleeping pill, and they have barbiturates. And they kill about 10,000 people a year with overdoses of those things, but that's okay. It's a prescription, and they're watching out for us. And remember, George Bush, when he went to Japan, they gave him some Halcyon so he could sleep on the way to Japan because of the time difference. And when he woke up, one of the side effects of Halcyon is nausea and vomiting. I don't know how you say it in Japanese, but it was very dramatic on world TV, right? Not very presidential. Blah! And so I'm sure that's why he lost the election, because he puked over that Japanese ambassador. And then, of course, there's kidney stones, and then there's uh, bone spurs, heel spurs, and calcium deposits. Again, physicians will tell you the first thing to give up nutritionally is calcium and dairy because they have this foolish belief, the stupid belief, the ignorant belief that the calcium in kidney stones, bone spurs, heel spurs, and calcium deposits come from your diet when instead it only comes from your bones when you have a raging osteoporosis. And when you get these things, you need more calcium, not less. Then there's cramps and twitches. You wake up in the middle of the night and your foot is all cramped up around your neck and you say, Lord, take me from the knee down. I'm not going to make it till morning. We've all experienced that. That's very common. Then there's PMS, premenstrual syndrome. You know, the emotional and physical stuff. The medical treatment of choice for PMS is what we call a hysterical ectomy. It's been shortened to hysterectomy. That's a 100-year-old treatment. And the doctors do about 285,000 unnecessary hysterical ectomies a year, but it makes Mercedes payments, so they do them. Even the AMA said they're unnecessary, but they don't take their licenses away, and people keep going to them. You imagine a poor woman in her 30s, she says, Doc, you got to do something. Every time I go out to hang up the clothes, my neighbor's kids run down the basement screaming, Witch, my own kids think I'm crazy. My husband's leaving me. I'm going to lose my job. you got to do something. Well, the University of California in San Diego came out three years ago now and said, if you just double the RDA of calcium intake, you'll get rid of 85% of the emotional and physical symptoms of PMS. And when that came out, there were huge lines around the health food stores around the blocks and people had sleeping bags because they closed before they all got their calcium and every person in line was a man. 
They were there for their daughters and their girlfriends and their wives and things like that. Okay, and lastly is low back pain. 85% of Americans get low back pain whether you work on a computer or you unload hay or you drive big trucks, doesn't matter. Low back is a big problem. Low back is just osteoporosis of the vertebrae, whether you have a disc problem or whatnot, because if your disc doesn't have anything to hold on to, your vertebrae have melted away, what's going to happen to the disc? Especially if you have a copper deficiency because they're made out of elastic fibers, they go like a water balloon with a lot of pressure on them. I just want you to look at this quickly before we do the last mineral. Low back, you go to an orthopedic surgeon or a rheumatologist, you might get a muscle relaxant. You might get Valium and a muscle relaxant. You get a laminectomy. You get your vertebrae fused. You might get a disc operation. They don't tell you 75% of the time you'll never be the same again, right? PMS, you go to your OBGYN. You can um, go to an internist. You can go to a family counselor, a shrink, or a divorce attorney. Cramps and twitches, you go to a neurologist. You go to a sports medicine doctor, an internist. Bone spurs, heel spurs, calcium deposits. You go to a rheumatologist, an orthopedic surgeon, or a podiatrist. Kidney stones, you go to a urologist or an internist or a surgeon. Insomnia, you go to a shrink or a um, sleep clinic or an internist. Hypertension, you go to a cardiologist, an internist or a, a surgeon. Arthritis, a rheumatologist, an orthopedic surgeon or an internist. Receding gums, you go to a dentist or a periodontist. Osteoporosis, you go to all those health specialists, including a tum salesman. For nothing more than a calcium deficiency, it costs you 10 cents a day to deal with. Now, on the average, because Americans have insurance and we have Medicare and Medicaid, we spend on the average $25,000 to $250,000, and we undergo five to ten surgical procedures a year for a calcium deficiency. And we beg the doctors to do it. We beg the doctors to do it. Well, it's our choice. The last one I'll share with you is diabetes. Everybody's touched by diabetes. It's the number three cause of death in adults in the United States. Number three cause of death. And it has terrible complications and side effects, diabetes. The side effects include blindness of many kinds. Then there's a kidney failure with dialysis and kidney transplant. There's cardiovascular disease of all kinds. And of course, that contributes to the number one cause of death. Then there's amputations. Everybody ought to have one of those because they're totally paid for in their health thing. They assume that you're not just going to get one because you want to get everything on your health benefits. And then you shorten your life because if you have diabetes, on the average, you have a shorter lifespan than someone who doesn't have diabetes. Now, we learned in 1957 in the animal industry that we could prevent and cure diabetes with two trace minerals. That's a pretty profound statement, that we could prevent and cure diabetes with two trace minerals in 1957 in animals. It was published in Federation Proceedings, which is the official journal of the American science. The National Institutes of Health, the official monthly journal, is August 1957. Well, the two trace minerals that you can get to prevent and cure this are chromium and vanadium. Vanadium alone, according to the University of Vancouver, British Columbia Medical School, vanadium alone will replace insulin in adult onset diabetics, which represent 85% of all diabetics. Of course, they can't quit their insulin cold turkey. They've got to gradually wean off of it. It takes four to six months for most people to slowly wean off of insulin if they're taking in adequate amounts of chromium and vanadium. Now, to me, this is criminal because if you write to uh, Hill's packing company that makes Science Diet dog food, right over here in Topeka, Kansas, so they manufacture Science Diet dog food and other Science Diet products, high-tech foods for animals. If you write them and say, how many minerals exactly is in Science Diet for dog food? They'll write you back and say, there's 40 minerals. You write uh, Checkerboard Square in St. Louis, Ralston Imperial, and say, just how many minerals are in your rat pellets for laboratory rats? And they'll say, there's 28 minerals. I'll give anybody in this room a crisp new $100 bill if you can find me a human infant formula in a grocery store that has more than 11. So our dogs get 40 minerals. Remember, that's what Mike Murphy was saying. His dog never seems to get sick because he's getting this canned dog food with all these vitamins and minerals in there. So our dogs get 40 minerals, our rats get 28 minerals, and our human infants get 11. Is that fair? No, that's called fraud. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're talking about SMA, Similac, Isomil, Pro Soy B. In fact, that's why they call Similac Similac, because it lacks everything. <laughs> okay, if I've convinced you that you have to consciously take in all the minerals yourself, that you can't depend on your food, and certainly you can't depend on anything that's boxed or packaged or bottled, 
There's three types of minerals that you have to be concerned about. One is metallic minerals, and metallic minerals are essentially ground up rocks. Metallic minerals are things like oyster shell, eggshell, dolomite, limestone, uh, calcium carbonate, clays of various kinds, Mount Marulanite clay, seabed minerals, tums. They're only 8 to 12 percent absorbable. When you reach age 35 to 40, it drops down to 3 to 5 percent. And I have to tell you a story here. I ran into a guy at a meeting like this up at Grand Rapids, Michigan. And this fellow owns a porta potty business. You know, that's that green or blue colored outhouse. Man, if we'd only had one of those back when I was a kid. We had these ones with splinters, you know, in the wood. He said, I see something that, that describes that in my porta potty business. I said, what's that? He says, well, when we take those things back to the shop to clean them out with a pressure hose, he says, we put a, a quarter inch grid underneath them because kids throw rocks and sticks and toys in there. And if we don't put a grid there, it blocks up the sewer system. It costs us thousands of dollars to fix it. Every time we clean one of those out, we find hundreds of vitamin tablets. I said, well, how do you know they're vitamin tablets? He said, well, that's really easy. He says, right on the coating, it says Theragram M, one a day centrum. He says, come here. He takes me out in the back of his shop, and there's this literal mountain of all these vitamin pills he got out of his porta potties. If you read the labels on those multiples, they say your iron it comes in the form of iron oxide. What is iron oxide? Rust. You might as well just go out to an old railroad track and take your butter knife and scrape some of that rust off and lick it and you're going to get your iron supplement, but well, that's what they're giving you. Uh, I'll show you how bad it is if you take something like calcium lactate, which is a common metallic uh, mineral. Uh, let's say it's a calcium tablet, calcium lactate, 1,000 milligrams. If you take two of those, you're not getting 2,000 milligrams of calcium. In fact, I have people all the time say, well, I took lots of calcium, Doc. I hear you on the radio talking about calcium and arthritis, and I took 2,000 milligrams of calcium a day. It didn't help my arthritis. In fact, it got worse. I said, well, what kind of calcium are you taking? They said, calcium lactate. Well, there's your problem, because only 250 milligrams of that is metallic calcium. So let's say you absorb 10% of that. Then the other 750 milligrams is lactose or milk sugar. So 10% of 250 is 25. So if you take two of those tablets, you're not getting 2,000. You're getting 50 milligrams. So to get what you need, you need to take 90 of those tablets a day. You need to take 30 with each meal, and you've got 59 more minerals to go. And there's those people who want to do things naturally. Let's see if you can do anything good with 10 pounds of spinach. And let's be fair, let's see if you can get 1,000 milligrams of magnesium. And I picked magnesium because in green leafy vegetables, you have a lot of magnesium because of the chlorophyll, right? It's part of the chlorophyll molecule. And any pound of anything, you got 454 grams. And 10 pounds of spinach, you got 4,540 grams, of which most of that, 97%, is water. And let's say you have one gram of chlorophyll in that... 10 pounds of spinach, there's 50 milligrams of magnesium. You got to divide that into the thousand you want. You get a factor of 20, which you multiply times the 10. You have to eat 200 pounds of spinach. You got 58 more minerals to go. Okay, so you got to be a pretty big person to accomplish all this. Even as big as I am, you can't get it done. So I prefer to supplement rather than do those things. Then, of course, during the 60s, the agricultural industry came up with chelated minerals because farmers aren't dumb enough to pay for a dollar of something that goes into an animal's mouth and have 99 cents come out in the manure. I have to really thank farmers for being that clever. And chelated minerals are just metallic minerals with an amino acid or protein or enzyme wrapped around the metal atom and increase the absorbability to 40%. Then the health food industry jumped on that right away because it was a major improvement in absorbability of minerals. The most efficient way to absorb minerals is liquid. They're very small particle size are 7,000 times smaller than a red blood cell and they're negatively charged so you actually have an electrical or magnetic gradient that concentrates these minerals. Plants have a very interesting part to play in colloidal minerals. Remember we said that plants cannot create minerals. If they're not in the soil, plants can't make them. At any rate, metallic minerals are taken up by plants when they're in the soil. Plants convert them in their tissues to colloidal minerals. And this is how we store minerals in our body. This is how we use minerals in our body. This is how we transport minerals from their storage place to their site of use in the colloidal form. Well, our plants, our crops don't have much in the way of colloidal minerals in them because we don't have any metallic minerals in our soil. Are these minerals important? You bet your life they're important. Information and statements regarding dietary supplements discussed have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. For more information, 
Get back with the person who gave you the